to improve there that we will do that. It will be based, as it always has been, on the best science available to us at the time. Uh, and so we've done many of those things in the past. In the last month, we've introduced that pre-flight testing. We've introduced mandating of masks on planes, mandating of masks in airports. Uh, we've continue, continued to look at the way that uh, people are transported to the quarantine hotels. We continue to look uh, at, at the procedures uh, and the systems and the safety of our quarantine hotels. Uh, and as of this week, New South Wales has developed a, uh, a, a, a post-quarantine checkup, including a, a, um, a day 16 test. So uh, I've asked uh, my New South Wales colleagues to, uh, to give a proposal through to AHPPC, and we'll be looking at that later this week around that particular component. But that's, that's one of many things we're looking at. Uh, the, other, the other element, of course, which is uh, uh, related to that is, is the vaccine, uh, is the variance of concern. And so we've been charting that very, very carefully, uh, not only from the international information, but also here in Australia. Uh, so as of the 5th of February, we've now had 87 samples of the B117 strain, which initially uh, was found in the UK, but is now being found in many other countries around the world uh, in our hotel quarantine system. Um, we've also had 18 samples of the B1351 strain, ori originally found in South Africa, um, and, uh, and we know that that's also spreading around the world. So there's 80 countries across all six WHO regions have now had imported cases uh, or community transmission of the B117 strain, and for the, uh, the South African strain, 41 countries have, have reported that. Um, so that is becoming the normal strain of the virus that is circulating around the world and we need to be prepared for those strains which are definitely more able to be transmitted between people, um, may be associated with more severity but that is still information we need to continue to watch uh, carefully. Um, and then uh, the, the uh, talk about how they may affect the vaccines. And so just to talk briefly about uh, our vaccine program, that's all completely on track, enormous amount of work being done across the Australian government with our state and territory colleagues, uh, with GPs, pharmacies and others that will be delivering this. Our logistics uh, are being worked through. Uh, we're setting up our vaccine operations centre here, here in uh, the health department to work through um, the scenarios of how we get those vaccines to where they need to be. Uh, we know that Pfizer has, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved by the TGA. Uh, and we are um, looking very much towards uh, a, a delivery of that in the coming weeks. Uh, and we're definitely on track uh, to have those first vaccines uh, being delivered by the end of February, as we've said, as the Prime Minister has announced. Um, in terms of AstraZeneca, uh, that is continuing, continuing to progress through the approvals process with the TGA. Uh, this is a very good vaccine. It's very safe. Uh, and uh, once it goes through those processes, um, uh, of safety, quality and efficacy, uh, we will be able to uh, then to look to roll out that vaccine as well, subject of course always to the TGA advice. Um, in terms of the AstraZeneca vaccine in particular, in relation to reports around it, uh, it its uh, effectiveness, um, uh, particularly in relation to the South African variant of concern, uh, I, I just want to make a very clear statement about um, people taking um, small amounts of information um, quickly without looking at it carefully um, and making conclusions. So at the moment, I can absolutely say, and this may change in the future and we'll be nimble in the way we look at that information uh, and, and bring that into our planning. Uh, but at the moment, there is no evidence anywhere in the world that AstraZeneca uh, AstraZeneca's effectiveness against severe infection is affected by any of these uh, variants of concern. Um, and and that's, that's, that's the fact. Uh, what we have at the moment is a small group of, uh, of people in a study which has not yet been peer reviewed or published uh, in South Africa uh, where uh, there was an effect uh, on the mild or moderate disease in relation to um, uh, the, that variant of concern in that country. Uh, but there were no severe infections in any of the people that received the vaccine um, 
uh, in regards to any of those types of the virus. So we don't have any information on that. And we'll obviously be looking at it carefully as time goes by, and every day we get more information uh, about that. We're, we will be talking actually uh, in the coming days uh, with our uh, UK counterparts uh, to really look carefully at what their experience is in relation to the very widespread use of AstraZeneca uh, in that country across all age groups. So uh, that will be helpful data for us to in our planning uh, for the coming weeks and months uh, and also for the TGA uh, in their assessment. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll go to questions first in the room. Professor, when will the first uh, Pfizer jabs actually be on the tarmac here in Australia? Um, so I, I won't go into great details there and of course I, there's always the caveat, uh, they, are, they do have to come from another country um, and uh, we heard this morning from the, from the EU representative in, in Australia that they are definitely looking to, to allow that to happen which was a very good, very good news and, and Pfizer in our, our virtually constant discussions with them uh, also guarantee that they are on target to, to bring that uh, to Australia in the coming weeks. Next week? Well, we remember if we work backwards from we, we have told we have told the Australian public and the Prime Minister is on uh, has said this and we are absolutely going by this timetable. We will have uh, uh, do doses ready to be injected before the end of February, and I think it, I'll just leave it at how that. Long does the, so we know that when they get here, the TGA has to do the batch testing. How long do they need to do that? As in, I guess working backwards, what's the latest they could arrive? for them to still be able to start this month? Yeah, I'm not going to give you an exact date, but, uh, but look, it's a, it's a few days. It's days rather than weeks to do that last piece of testing. That, that's important. That's, that's the, the, the final piece of the quality. Uh, and we would do the same with the, when, when the AstraZeneca vaccines arrive from overseas, and we would need to do it again for the AstraZeneca product out of CSL. And once they're actually on the tarmac, how long before? What's the next step once they touch down? Well, well they'll, they'll touch down and remember the Pfizer vaccine needs to be kept very strictly at a minus 70 temperature, so there's logistic exercises there. But we have our logistic partners in DHL and, and Linfox who will be doing the, um, the storage and the distribution uh, in conjunction with Pfizer. Uh, and so they'll arrive, they'll be distributed, they have to go via the TGA for this final test, uh, and then we'll be working with uh, uh, the Pfizer hubs that we've, 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 uh, se we're setting up with the states and territories uh, to get them to the place they need to be for the injections. My understanding was batch testing was actually being done overseas, so is there more batch testing to be done once they get here? Correct. Right. Um, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to ask about something different about, you talked about um, that the AstraZeneca data with the South African strain, that being a very, I guess, small amount of data. Mm. We have, I guess, more robust data about the Novavax vaccine and its um, effect, efficacy, um, including against the South African strain and the UK strain. Mm. Have we considered waiting until the Novavax vaccine is available? I think in the past you've said um, that that could be a more long-term answer for the world, that vaccine. So a couple of things I'd say there about, about the vaccines. We, we, we need to and, and should and must use the vaccine that we have. Um, so we'll be receiving the, the Pfizer vaccine uh, in the coming weeks. Um, we'll be using that. Um, if, assuming that AstraZeneca gets through the final hurdles of the TGA process, we will be using that. When the Novavax vaccine goes through those processes, and they are you know, several months behind those other two that I've mentioned, uh, we'll be using that. How, how they're used together and so forth, this is emerging information we'll look at. Um, but I'd imagine that the, the, the protein-based vaccines you know, will, will be important uh, longer term, as, as potentially others will be, uh, in relation, particularly in relation to the variants, uh, as we get, gather more information about that. So just to step back to Pfizer, so we're expecting 80,000 doses to be delivered straight up. Mm -hmm. So how soon before the next 80,000 will be delivered? Uh, we, we've, the, the contract we have with, uh, with Pfizer is that we will have um, uh, now 20 million doses between, between now and the end of the year. Uh, they will be coming regularly uh, and, and uh, week, there'll be a weekly, um, uh, a weekly delivery is what we're, we're aiming for. That's assuming no disruption to supply and, and, and the air bridge and so forth. But, but we, we will be expecting to receive them every week. We will be starting to vaccinate within a few days of them being available. Uh, and then that will continue. Uh, and, and so when you 
say vaccinate within a few days of availability, do you mean a few day, within a few days of delivery? So once they've actually touched down on the tarmac, jabs should be in arms a few days later. There's that quality step, remember. So once that quality hurdle has been finalised, then shortly after that we'll be looking to start vaccination. By the end of the month, I'm not going to go into any further detail. With the um, 80,000 doses that come in first, sorry, this is just yeah. on the same topic. Yeah. Um, Professor Murphy has said, um, because it's obviously two doses, and he said, we won't start something we can't finish. So does that mean that first rollout will be 40,000 people, not as, it, as do you keep the doses aside to make sure that that can be finished off? How does that work? Well, certainly we do. The, the, both the AstraZeneca and the uh, Pfizer vaccines are a two-dose schedule, so we need to make sure that we have enough uh, for, for that. We, we don't want a lot of uh, vaccines sitting around in, in warehouses, so we'll be looking to, to roll out particularly for those most uh, those priority populations that people all know about now uh, as soon as we can. Uh, but then on the third week, we'll be going back to those same population, those same people um, uh, to give them their second dose. Particularly with the Pfizer, that's really important, that three-week interval. Um, we will await the TGA advice in relation to AstraZeneca, but, but some of the information uh, that has been coming out in the last few weeks is that it may actually be a longer interval uh, for that second dose. I'm going to go to the phone to give them a chance as okay. there's some other people there. So I'll go to, to Paul, uh, Paul Osborne from AAP. Uh, thank you. Um, Got uh, two questions. The first is, um, as part of your review work, is any work being done to start recording the details of Australians who've had um, COVID shots overseas? And I ask because it could be useful in knowing not only how many doses we need here, but also down the track when we're looking at um, policies such as shortening quarantine periods and things like that. Um, well, certainly there's a lot of work uh, that's being done with our overseas partners in relation to um, uh, vaccine certificates and the like, and so, so proof of vaccination will be an important component to that. But look, at the moment we have a, a laser-like focus on, on, on commencing the, the Australian program for people that are in Australia. Uh, and that includes all Australians in Australia, but in fact anyone who's in Australia will be eligible to be vaccinated. So, um, so that, that's, that's our main aim at the moment and uh, those, that, that overseas component will, 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 will come along as an important issue later. Uh, at the moment, just to reiterate, there's no, um, we're not looking to change our two-week uh, quarantine, uh, hotel quarantine procedures. Um, and a, a second um, unrelated question, um, is it true that vaccines such as Moderna can be more easily modified to deal with um, variants? Um, apparently the, the genetic information can be more easily rewritten and revised than the other, other types of, um, of vaccines. So, so what we've seen in the last uh, year since we've, we've, we've started on this, what I've called before a moonshot to uh, to, to find at least one vaccine that works uh, against COVID, the first uh, ever to be used in humans uh, successfully. We're now in this extraordinary position where we have multiple vaccines that have been shown, shown to work um, and uh, under, uh, with several different platforms, including two very innovative platforms. One of those is the mRNA vaccines. Uh, they were unheard of uh, a year ago in terms of humans and certainly an unproven technology. Um, the second one is the, is the viral vector vaccines, that's the AstraZeneca, uh, so the mRNA is Pfizer and Moderna uh, and others. AstraZeneca, the, the Russian uh, Sputnik V vaccine is another, uh, another um, viral vector vaccine. Uh, and then there's the more traditional ones like protein vaccines, Novavax being one of those examples and, and other even more traditional um, uh, vaccines like the, the Chinese ones which are an inactivated virus for example. Um, so the more traditional methods, one of the issues with those are, are they do take a long time to change uh, and to modify. Uh, the great advantage of both the mRNA and also the viral vector vaccines is they can be done more rapidly. Essentially they're the same um, use of an RNA molecule um, but a different way of delivering it. Uh, the, 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 the issue though is that it's one thing to change the vaccine. Um, there's another issue to make nine billion of them. Um, and so if we're going to vaccinate the whole world, 
that's going to take time. And, and so, uh, yes, it's an advantage to be able to change the vaccine quickly, but you still have those issues of being able to get an adequate supply and going through regulatory processes, uh, which I would imagine will be easier second time around, but that will be for the regulatory authorities to consider. I'll just go to Tamsin now at the Herald Sun. Um, I also have two questions, if that's all right, but on the same topic. Um, we've heard a lot about um, hotel quarantine over the past few weeks, people saying that potentially we should be quarantining people away from large population centres and instead having centres in the regions. I'm just wondering if you could outline some of the reasons that we haven't done that already and I guess what are some of the difficulties of um, a plan like that? Um, so if people cast their mind back to about a year ago, we did do that. Uh, we did have our first case, uh, our first uh, quarantine system was actually in, in Christmas Island when we, uh, when we evacuated people from Wuhan. Um, we learned a lot from, from, from that process, um, uh, and, but one of the major things was, it was, uh, was, was, was the problems of having such a remote um, uh, setting for, for quarantine. Uh, and as we've gone through that process now with, as I said, over 200,000 people coming back, um, people who are coming back, particularly the most vulnerable uh, that have registered with the with, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs because of their vulnerability uh, and needing to come back for multiple reasons, is they, they come back because they have other issues. So we've seen mental health issues, we've seen um, severe other physical issues like um, uh, end stage cancer, people about to give birth, um, all sorts of, of reasons why you actually need uh, good care uh, on site and also an ability to be able to get people to hospital if they're needed uh, or, or to, arrange, uh, to access a range of services uh, which are more available in, in our capital cities. The second thing I would say is that one of the, one of the most risky times of, 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 uh, of, of transmission uh, during that end-to-end -end phase of, of, of what we call hotel quarantine is actually the transport from, uh, from, the, uh, from the airport to the actual uh, facility. And so the, the longer that is, the more, more risk there is. So there's a range of issues there. We've looked at uh, what, if any, um, other, other uh, suitable accommodation may be available outside of the capital cities and we've looked in great detail at, for example, the, the Gladstone proposal which was put forward by the Queensland Premier recently. Uh, there is one on the table that was discussed briefly at, at National Cabinet around uh, a proposal in Toowoomba. Um, so, uh, so there's two options. Uh, we had the Howard Springs facility, it, it's, it's on the edge of Darwin, it's not very far from Darwin really, but it is in a more rural area. Um, so, so we've looked closely at that. At the time when we started the, the hotel quarantine system, our hotels uh, were lying empty, uh, essentially, because of the limitation in travel, uh, and so that played into it. But I'd, I'd just like to stress that this is really a, a very good system which, that has had some, some issues recently which we're addressing, as I said, and looking at ways of, of continuously improving the quality. But it has worked well. Uh, and will continue to work well and be able to deal with um, those other issues uh, that I mentioned. In your second question, Tamsin. Thanks. Uh, also just wondering, Daniel Andrews today in his press conference said that the Victorian hotel quarantine system was a, was a higher standard than that of New South Wales. Is any one state doing better on hotel quarantine? What are the differences? Uh, so I don't think I'll get into state rivalries. Um, but um, I'll, I would say that um, we have learned a lot as a, as a nation uh, about uh, hotel quarantine. Um, the Victorians have the advantage, of course, of having had a Royal Commission or a special commission into, the, into their uh, hotel quarantine issues from the middle of last year, and they've, they've certainly uh, had to and have addressed um, some of the issues that were, that were highlighted in that, in that time. Uh, all of the states have been examined by, uh, by, under the Holton Review. Jane Holton, the previous uh, uh, um, department uh, secretary here in, in the Department of Health in Canberra, um, she's gone to every state and territory and, lo and looked closely uh, at, at all of those arrangements and given advice. Um, but beyond those things, we've, we've continuing to look at what has happened uh, uh, over the last uh, uh, several months and, and to learn from those things. And some, some have been some very specific 
un unintended or unimagined issues uh, that have been addressed and corrected. Uh, and there's others that we discussed at AHPPC yesterday uh, and put on the table, let's look at this, let's, let's look at that, under, under uh, testing whilst people are in quarantine in terms of the uh, returnees themselves or the staff, uh, both in fact, um, what can we do around the hierarchy of, of uh, infection prevention and control? Um, should we be looking clo more closely at, at, uh, at, at other elements about uh, the movement to, or fr to and from quarantine, uh, where people should be housed if they're positive, those sort of things. Um, so we'll continue to do that work. I'll go to Claire Armstrong uh, now from the Daily Telegraph. Professor, uh, on a number of occasions now you've had to defend the efficacy of the vaccines that we are getting. A lot of that seems to be down to confusion around the goal in that it's about reducing mortality and serious illness more so than contracting the virus. Can you explain for Australians, is it likely that they have to accept that they will possibly get COVID even after having the vaccine? but the actual benefit is that they won't die. Do you think that the, that understanding of efficacy could be better explained given people repeatedly raise concerns with AstraZeneca? Um, that's, that's a great question. Thanks, Claire. So, uh, look, it, the initial... Uh, what we're initially trying to do for the, for the vaccine rollout, I, I think it's been very clear, but if we need to make it clearer, we'll, we'll continue to say this. We are looking to protect those uh, who are most vulnerable. And by, by that I mean those that, that are, who are most likely to be exposed to the, uh, to the disease uh, or once exposed and, and infected, most likely to have severe illness. And so that, they are, that is our fundamental first task of the, of the um, strategy that we've undertaken. So that's, that's how we've come up with our priority population. So we are going out absolutely at the start to vaccinating, vaccinating anyone who is involved with our quarantine um, uh, process and thinking about that as end-to-end. -end. So people uh, who are air crew, people that are um, at the airport, people that are involved, involved in our hotel quarantine system. Um, because they are the ones that are at the moment the most likely to be exposed. Then we work through with, with frontline healthcare workers, we work with those uh, that are in aged care or those that care for them on the basis, again, that they're most likely to be exposed and or most likely to be severely af uh, affected. Um, so that is, our, that is our aim first up. As this flows through and we, uh, later in the year, we'll, we'll be looking to, um, to offer the vaccine to everyone in Australia that wants a vaccine. And I really encourage everyone to consider taking a vaccine when it becomes available for you. Um, uh, I certainly will be, my colleagues will be when our turn comes. Uh, and so that's when we can start to think about how that plays out into decreasing um, the virus spreading in the community. But it's mostly about severe disease right now. That's why the efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine against severe illness and death, uh, which is both very, very high, approaching 100%, is enormously good news. In terms of what that might do in, in, in ways of us getting back to some sort of post-COVID normality or COVID normality. Uh, this was raised um, in the press conference after uh, National Cabinet on Friday, where exactly those issues that you've raised there, Claire, uh, were, were mentioned. Um, and that's why Phil Gachins, who's the, who's the uh, Secretary of the Department of, Premier, uh, of Prime Minister and Cabinet here in, in uh, Canberra, uh, together with his colleagues in other states and territories, with medical advice uh, from the AHPPC, with economic advice through Treasury, uh, the Treasurer, uh, Treasury Department and others, will be really examining what it looks like in Australia um, later on this year when we've got a, a good vaccine rollout uh, and trying to get back to some sort of uh, new normal, if you like. Uh, but that new normal will almost certainly uh, mean that we will have virus circulating in Australia. But if we can protect people from uh, from the disease, that is the main aim at the moment uh, in terms of uh, preventing people going to hospital, preventing people going to intensive care and preventing death. Did you have another question, Claire? Uh, yes, sorry, just quickly, uh, it was also mentioned that Pfizer would be giving us an update on the 
longer term delivery of, of the vaccine by the middle of this month. So we still are we still waiting for that? What's the status and when we'll find out beyond the eighty thousand doses what the schedule is? Um, so uh, they, they've certainly committed to those extra doses that were um, uh, were announced last week. So 20 million by the end of the year. How, how that plays out after those initial initial uh, four to six weeks, I, I'm not sure that we have that yet. It does, of course, depend on uh, on the global demand, etc., uh, and their ability to to keep up with that demand, uh, which is a challenge, a, a good challenge to have, of course. Um, there, are, there are now millions and millions, tens of millions even, uh, of people around the world who have, have received their vaccination. So uh, in one sense that's, that's good, but uh, they have guaranteed that they will supply us uh, and there'll be more details once we start to roll out how that, how that works uh, for both the, um, uh, for the Pfizer doses. Uh, the AstraZeneca, we do expect a, a, an early um, uh, delivery from overseas, but then backed up quickly uh, from next month uh, with our locally grown supply uh, through CSL. Uh, Steph Dalzell is on from the ABC. Hi Professor Kelly. I understand there's no evidence that the AstraZeneca vaccine isn't effective on severe, strain, uh, severe uh, cases of the virus, but what about mild and moderate cases? Is there evidence that the vaccine offers minimal protection against mild and moderate cases of variants of COVID-19, the South African variant, for example, and is that concerning? And if it's not concerning, has South Africa acted prematurely here? So, I, look, I, I won't talk for the South African authorities. They'll need to make their decision on the basis of the information they have, but particularly what they, what they are trying to achieve, achieve through their own vaccination, um, uh, vaccination program. I just just stress again that we're looking to prevent severe disease. There is no evidence that there is an issue with severe disease uh, in relation to that variant or other other variants at this moment. Um, uh, and so they, they've acted on that information. It's become you know widely available. Of course, all information we take into account. Um, uh, but our, our aim at the moment is not about mild and moderate disease, it's about severe disease and so we will continue to push ahead. I, I'll just say though that the, 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 our, our initial uh, strategy based on getting as many, vac as, as many people vaccinated as possible, starting with those most vulnerable groups, um, is only the start of this. We, we may find that, uh, that all of the vac vaccines have, have issues either with the, the variants of concern or uh, they only last for a, a limited period in terms of their, um, of their uh, effectiveness. Now, we don't know that because we, there's just no one in the world that has had two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or AstraZeneca or any of the other vaccines um, for more than a few months. Uh, so we just do not know yet uh, about that. We do not know um, certain issues in relation to uh, particular subgroups of the population. So I'm often asked about pregnant women, people, uh, women that are, that are, um, uh, are breastfeeding, uh, people with particular immune suppression and so forth. These are things that we'll need to keep looking at carefully over the coming months and, and even years. Um, so, so I think there's, there's lots of information. We take it all on board, uh, but we're continuing in our process through that, uh, through that um, program. Do you have a second question, Steph? Yeah, I actually have a follow-up to that. In terms of um, advising, like we've heard in, uh, in committees that uh, pregnant women, for example, are being advised to talk to their GPs. But if the na nation's medical experts don't have a, a decision or, or a direction in terms of whether these women who are pregnant, for example, should be getting the jab, how could a GP be able to uh, provide that information or be able to assist them? Um, so it's a very good point. I think uh, so. This this uh, goes into the same issue I was just talking about there, where we are are um, going through all of the processes to make sure uh, that, that the TGA regulatory advice and our expert committees, like the Australian Technical Advisory Gru Group on Immunisation, uh, are looking at all these all of this information and giving uh, direct and clear advice. Um, to our uh, practitioners that are actually giving uh, the, the vaccine, whether that's GPs or pharmacists or, or, or nurses uh, in certain circumstances. So, um, but they can't give advice if they don't have the information. So they can give a balanced view, uh, and they will do, uh, about that. Um, we can talk about what has happened uh, after the, um, uh, the uh, regulate, regulatory decisions have been made 
um, in other countries and indeed eventually in Australia uh, and, and look at the real world experience. And the real world experience, for example, in Israel, where they have now uh, vaccinated um, uh, a, a large proportion of their population, uh, that's how they've been handling it. They've had a, left it to an individual choice uh, for, for pregnant women in those circumstances on the balance of risk versus benefit. And so uh, the risk of getting um, uh, um, uh, COVID-19 in Australia at the moment is obviously much lower than it is in Israel. Uh, and so perhaps um, the, the sensible thing would be to wait, but that could change. Um, so that's the sort of um, discussion that would be had um, with uh, the usual pra your usual practitioner uh, rather than in an absence of, of um, of advice, if that makes sense. I'll just go to the room for la last two questions, thanks. Uh, Professor, the AMA says that pharmacies should be excluded from the roll-up because they're not equipped to deal with adverse reactions. What's your reaction to that? So uh, the AMA represents doctors, um, and so that's an important thing to consider. Um, uh, we, we, we've made a decision to, to look at, at, at the widest access we can uh, for this vaccine. Uh, Pharmacists have been vaccinating uh, in uh, all states and territories now for some years, uh, at least some of the vaccination programs, and so they are experienced. Uh, I would say that pharmacists won't be joining the, uh, the rollout until later in the year, and by that stage we'll have a much uh, better understanding uh, of all of those matters, including the, the risk of side effects. Um, there, there have been, and there were early, early um, uh, reports from the UK, I think even on the first day when they started uh, with their Pfizer vaccine rollout uh, about, uh, about allergic reactions. Um, as, as time has progressed, that, that is actually, actually extremely rare, about 11 per million. So, um, so it's not a big, a big deal, but it, it is certainly that safety component is an important thing to consider. We've talked in the past about, uh, I guess, the vaccine portfolio that we've had and that Australia signed up for specific vaccines before we knew any of their efficacy data, anything like that. If we were to then, now there's a lot more data out there, say go to Moderna or go to another company and try and get them on our portfolio, would that cost us significantly more money because that data's out there now? So the main, the main issue is supply. Uh, and so we, we made our decisions uh, and Moderna was on the table there as a potential and we decided to go for one mRNA candidate which, is, which ended up being Pfizer. Uh, that's, that's the company that we have the relationship with and as we say within the coming weeks we'll be expecting uh, those, uh, those uh, first doses to arrive, very exciting. Um, we did the same with, with AstraZeneca, one of those viral vector vaccines. We, did, we had two protein vaccines, um, the, the UQ1 for unfortunate reasons uh, is not going ahead, but, uh, uh, but certainly the Novavax one we're very excited about. So th there's our three. We're also part of the COVAX facility. We can look um, to get uh, other vaccines through that, including Moderna, actually, they're, they're part of that. Um, but you know, I, I think my, my own view is that COVAX is mostly there for, for our, our neighbouring countries that we're also supporting. Um, this is a global pandemic. We need a global rollout of vaccines. Uh, and that's going to help protect Australia as well. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, um, so that the, the so the case in Wollongong uh, is, um, is is one of the uh, this was someone who was tested on day 16 after they arrived back in Australia, gone through the, the hotel quarantine process, had two negative. Um, uh, tests during during that and was was sent to the community. New South Wales this week has, has developed a, a system for following up everyone after they've gone uh, left um, the quarantine process and and, and advising the people to get a test even if they're asymptomatic. This is uh, the case in Wollongong. Uh, it came out positive, but my understanding is there's still three three op op options there. It's either a false positive. Uh, it could be a very long incubation period. Uh, it would be very long, uh, but it's possible uh, that they had carried it right through quarantine without being picked up, or that there was some uh, br uh, some uh, infection during the quarantine period. All of those three things are possible, uh, and are still under investigation. So I can't give any further details there. And with that in mind, is it likely that the medical expert panel recommend extending quarantine for some days? Um, that's that's not currently on the table, no. Thank okay. You. Thanks, everyone, on the phone, and thanks for those in the room. Bye.